Bob and Tim. Well, thank you. Uh, everyone hear me? All right. Thank you. Uh, we are thrilled to be here. Um, my name is Bob Crowley, and this is my uh, expedition partner and, uh, and friend, Tim Tweetmeyer. And this is our first time here at Okta, so we're, uh, we're kind of strange animals. We, we're actually uh, endurance athletes. We're mountain runners. And uh, so this is a fun thing for us to do here because we love running, but we also love reading, particularly American history, and, uh, and we love discovery. And so what we've tried to do uh, is to combine our three passions, running, reading, and getting out and discovering history, and we call it history trail trekking. <coughs> and so this was our first attempt to do it, and uh, we're going to take you on a little expedition with us today. Um, when we came across the Forlorn Hope, uh, we began, be, be, became fascinated with trying to discover the trail. And later, we became consumed with the people themselves. The Forlorn Hope route has been by, bypassed by most historians, probably due to the lack of primary research and little to no artifacts at all. And of course, uh, they got lost, and so there is no trail to follow. That's when our adrenaline kicked in, and we began a seven-year search to discover the trail of the Forlorn Hope. So let's get started. Over the next 40 minutes, we invite you to join on an expedition as we retrace the footsteps of the Forlorn Hope, share their story, and ultimately, their impact. This, this group got set up. Obviously, 1846, the time of manifest destiny. The pioneers were launching off in April from Independence St. Joe's, but they knew they had to get through Nevada and to California and over Donner Pass before the snows came. And in 1846, every party made it, except for one. The Donner Party arrived in late October, and by that time, the, the Donner Pass was already closed. They had been duped into taking Hastings Cutoff, which cost them days and time and also a lot of provisions in that time. Eighty of them were trapped, half of them over at the Elder, Alder Creek site north of Truckee and the other at Donner Lake, at the time Truckee Lake. And in the six weeks between uh, the time they arrived and the time they set off in the Forlorn Hope Party, they made several unsuccessful attempts to get over the pass, only to be rebuffed by weather and deep snows. And these were mostly small groups trying to reach out to the destination Johnson Ranch outside of today's modern-day Wheatland to get the news that everyone was trapped back there. And they realized at some point they just had to go and the game changer was the snowshoes. Franklin Graves, one of the group, and Charles Stanton fashioned snowshoes for the group so they could get out. And so they started out being known as the Snowshoe Party. And later to be known as Forlorn Hope after C.F. McClashton wrote the book, A History of the Donner Party. And if you know the military history on Forlorn Hope, that's kind of like a last gasp effort. This is it. If we don't make this, bad things happen. <laughs> 
So they fashioned snowshoes from rawhide and uh, pine boughs. And with the clothes they had, a rifle, an axe, a pistol, six days of provisions, but with that really didn't really mean much. A few strips of meat, some, maybe some sugar, and a few other little things. They had that, the clothes on their back. And they uh, started out on December 16th, 1846. And actually, to set the precedent of what it was like at the lake, the first person died the day before they left. And who would know that as these guys went out, that it would take them, they'd run into a hundred year storm, the only person that knew the way, their leader, would be the first one to perish. There were five times during the trip when they went more than three days without food. It would take them 33 days rather than what they expected to be the 10 to reach Johnson's Ranch. Along the way, eight of them would die, so more than half of the people perished on the way to Johnson Ranch. So this is their story, the forlorn hope, and we used an expedition as our way to try to discover the why and the how, to retrace the route, to honor those 17 souls who dared this selfless and desperate act, to honor their perseverance, endurance, and grit, and measure their impact and their legacy. Theirs is a tribute to ordinary people doing an extraordinary feat, an examination of the human instinct and the will to survive. They had to choose wisely who they sent on this trip. They needed the strongest bunch that were there out of the 80 or so folks that were trapped. There were 17 of them that volunteered to go. Mostly the mature ones who were strong enough to make it, yet young enough to be uh, strong enough to get, get to Johnson Ranch. And so they had to and a big enough group, it was a lot easier to move through the snow with a, with a larger group as one, the person in the front leading and the person in the back just walking in the snowshoe prints of the previous. So what you're seeing up here, scroll through now, are the names of those who went on the trip. And we carried tribute cards on our trek of every member of the Forlorn Hope with their picture and a bio on the back of where they came from, you know, what their job was and whatnot, a little bit of history. There were three fathers and three mothers, two siblings, a wife and a husband, three bachelors, and two Native Americans. The average age was 22, the oldest being Franklin Graves at 58, well older than most of the rest of the bunch, and the youngest 12-year-old Lemuel Murphy. But there was only one person that knew the trail, Charles Stanton. He had made the trip already when the Donner Party started to sputter back at Utah, Nevada line. He was sent all the way to Johnson's Ranch and came back with the two uh, Indian vaqueros with some mules and, and supplies and met the bunch back in Reno and came with them to the lake. And these guys were not experienced backcountry folks, right? They were just pioneers making their way through. And that's one of the things that really captured Bob and I in this trip is how they, we just took some ordinary Midwesterners and they were tasked with one of the most important endurance treks in American history. So what you see left up there is the seven people that made it. Five men, or five women and two men. So Tim and I spent about seven years discovering the hundred mile path of the Forlorn Hope from Donner Lake to Johnson Ranch nearby Wheatland, California. Our research tenants are shown here on this slide along next to the Okta Met Manual, which we use constantly for reference. We combined academic research with extensive field surveying, spending hundreds and hundreds of hours investigating clues in the field. We worked in close partnership with several historical societies, American history scholars, authors, canine forensics, and archaeologists. We field tested all the clues provided by primary and secondary sources, many of which were conflicted. We spent triple the time in the field in places the Forlorn Hope didn't go, eliminating theories by surveying the practicality of the landscape and or placing ourselves in the mindset of being cold, starved, and disoriented. And by dogged in field research, we eliminated all the illogical or impossible clues and narrowed it down to the most logical and defensible tre uh, trek. Once confident in the trail, we formed the expedition and we created a team 
and performed a reprise to experience firsthand the physical demands of the journey and try to gain insight into their motivations, empathy for their enormous struggles, and appreciation for their will to survive. We left Donner Memorial State Park on December 16th, 2020, on the 174th anniversary of the Forlorn Hope departure. So there's a picture of the expedition team a couple weeks before the uh, trip. Uh, you can probably recognize Bob and I, I'm on the left. Next over is Jennifer Hemmen. And then Bob and uh, Elka Reimer, both Belka and Jen, uh, live in the Auburn, California area. We know them well from uh, running events and doing some hiking together. And just like the Forlorn Hope, we needed to find some strong women because as we know, as the story goes, the ladies well outperform the fellows on this one. <laughs> uh, and so to give you an idea of some of, the, of our research we put together, um, we have a little video to show you. Uh, the way we built this, a lot of our maps and stuff was with the help of Bill Odegeist from the Donner, historical, uh, Donner Summit Historical Society. And then uh, towards the end of the video, you'll see us standing at the Johnson Ranch site, uh, which we were able to visit before we went on the trek because uh, Bill Holmes, oh, Steve, Bill, raise your hand. There's Bill. Bill got us access to that site and I'll tell you, both Bob and I had goosebumps on our arms standing at the Johnson Adobe where the Forlorn Hope survivors made it. So uh, you'll see a little bit of our prep and, and the middle part is gives you an idea what it's like in some of the places we went. It's a famous word we use all the time is just called boonie crashing. We boonie crash places because there's no trail. It's just forest. And so Roll it, Bob. Once they left Fort Bridger, this was the next structure they saw. Yeah, I know. Pretty that's much. what people don't realize. That's a thousand miles, right? That was that was the next civilization was Fort Bridger to Johnson's Ranch. Yeah. Thousand miles of open, you know. Yeah. And they were in a foreign country. Yeah, right. This is this was not going to the United States. This was going. Yeah. This, yeah, you're on the great time. unknown. And, yeah, eighteen forty-six. It's like we were kind of having a discussion yesterday. We were talking. Bob and I were talking to another rider. We said, you know, I was saying, when you look at Franklin Graves at fifty-eight. Yeah, that was. We were bold. considering, you know, he probably thought he wasn't going to make it, but he had to, he had to be the inspiration to get him going. Yeah. And then when he passes and tells his daughters, hey, you need to do what you need to do. Um, you know, it was kind of like I, I was getting, Bob, it's like uh, that scene in Glory at the end when they're on the beach and Matthew Broderick tells the <laughs> yeah. guy, and if this man foot should fall, who's going to pick up the flag? <laughs> and that's kind of like Franklin, like, hey, Kevin, you guys need to yeah. pick up the flag here. I'm, I'm not going to be able to help you any longer. You need to do this without me. And you know, they were able to press on. The plan for the Forlorn Hope was to follow the Overland Immigrant Trail that all wagon trains used in 1846 from Truckee Lake, now Donner Lake, to Sutter's Fort. Charles Stanton had successfully crossed the Sierra and just returned weeks earlier with extra provisions for the depleted Donner Party. He would become the Forlorn Hope's guide along with two Miwok Indians, Luis and Salvador, that accompanied Stanton from Sutter's Fort. Prior attempts to ascend and cross over the Donner Pass had failed due to the deep snow, estimated somewhere between 10 to 30 feet in places. Plus the relentless snowfall, wind and freezing temperatures all conspired to repel each attempt. Franklin Graves, a 58-year-old farmer from Vermont, determined snowshoes might be the solution. And he and Charles Stanton fashioned 14 pair out of oxbow and rawhide. What you see here is, is both of the routes depicted. Uh, the planned immigrant route is the black line all the way out to Johnson Ranch. And the red line is what the Forlorn Hope did. They wandered to this point at which they made the wrong turn, which it, not only did they end up going south and into one of the most <laughs> forbidden canyons in, in California, but not only did it take them, it took them out of their way about you know 30 miles or so, but it made it much more difficult terrain, as we'll explain in a bit. All they really had to do was get over I-80 here and drop into the Bear River, and, it, and the Bear River flows all the way to Johnson's Ranch. 
And they made a critical mistake right here, such that they ended up in the North Fork of the American. So this, this yellow highlight shows the trail followed by the Forlorn Hope for their first six days. And our next video will show the, uh, ex our expedition departing the Donner Memorial State Park at the east end of Donner Lake. We read a note from a direct descendant of Franklin Graves before heading out, and we trekked in the footsteps of these pioneers. Although the surface of the landscape has been changed by time, the mountains and valleys, canyons, rivers, and foothills remain the same. Our view was their view, and it humbled and excited us. In fact, it makes me choke up right now. The video shown next will show you the, the terrain that the Forlorn Hope actually would have witnessed between Truckee Lake and Carpenter Flat, 32 miles into their journey. What you're looking at the picture there is the first hero of the story, and that's Charles Stanton. Now, Charles was the only one who knew the way because he had made it over to Sutter's Fort and back already, and he really had no reason to return because he had no family back there. He had no wives or kids or anyone in the Donner Party that would be compelling him. When he went to Sutter's Fort to get provisions with Bill McCutcheon, they always thought Bill would be the one to come back. Charles would stay at the fort because that, that was safety. Bill got sick, and so that's when Charles came back. And he, well, although slight in stature, he was five foot five. Bill McCutcheon six foot six. Uh, he was the one they didn't expect to see again. But he came back with the Indians, and uh, in the first few days of the trip, they had some good weather, some bad weather, which hurt them both ways. The bad weather made it much harder. The good weather, being in that snow. Franklin Graves and Charles Stanton started to get snow blindness. And so they're having a hard time seeing. You know, Stanton, knowing, being the only one who knew the way, he was probably leading the bunch along, along the trip. And so on the fifth day, he barely made it into camp. And uh, they were asking about him. And he wasn't doing well. Snow blindness, fatigues, probably super hungry. The next day they started out, he was still there. And everyone said, hey, Charles, you getting up? You coming along? He says, I'll be along. And they never saw him again. Now you've got uh, 14, you know, pioneer the Forlorn Home Bunch with no leader in snowstorms. They're still in very thick snow. And uh, we, we believe he did this on purpose to not burden the bunch, right? He was like, I'm not going to make it. But rather you having to worry about getting me along the way, you folks continue much like Frank or Franklin Graves will do to say, you, you guys need to continue. I've gotten you this far. It's someone else's turn to relay and go. So, despite losing Stanton, they remained on the Overland Immigrant Trail until reaching the end of Six Mile Valley, near a place called Carpenter Flats, 32 miles in. It was here the Miwok became confused and the rest of the party disoriented. A blizzard was upon them, no ability to dead reckon, now out of food, wet, cold, frostbitten, and exhausted. Disagreements over whether to go back or press on ensued. Marianne Graves said she couldn't go back because she could not bear to listen to her little brothers and sisters beg for food. After much debate, it was decided to continue. But unbeknownst to them, their disorientation, combined with exhaustion and onset of starvation and hypothermia, led to a decision to follow the path of least resistance. Unfortunately, that was 180 degrees in the wrong direction. They instead follow the gentle slopes into one of the most desolate and dangerous places west of the Mississippi, the canyons of the North Fork of the American River. So this is where the wrong turn was, where the fateful mistake was made by the Forlorn Hope. Coming across Six Mile, they got into this little tree cover here, and you need to take a little climb and get over what is now I-80, and make that little rise over the ridge and then drop down into Bear Valley, and then you're home free because the Bear River flows right to Johnson's Ranch. But they made the mistake right here, and rather than getting over that ridge and getting into Bear Valley, they made a wrong turn and headed into the North Fork. And this is the beginning of the North Fork of the North Fork. So the, the land natural take, naturally takes you that direction, which is why we believe they went that way. Uh, and they were starting to get a little contentious. You can imagine, now they're a week out. They're in you know, heavy snow, terrible weather. And this is where they really start to fall apart. This is where Patrick Dolan makes the proposal of, well, 
we're not going to make it with the provisions we have. Maybe we should sacrifice one of the group for the better of the bunch. And so he proposes that and they agree to do it. So they draw straws. And of course, who lost the straw drawing contest? Patrick Dolan, the guy that proposed the idea in the first place. So then they take it out to the group and say, okay, well, who's going to go ahead and kill Patrick so we can all, you know, get some sustenance? And nobody had the gall to do it. Which kind of sees you're still not, they're not quite super desperate yet, but they're getting there. They're getting um, kind of contentious in the group. So they continue on down towards the North Fork of the Mara, which is a very nicely, gently flowing uh, terrain into an area that later on is, is, becomes known as the Camp of, of Death. So they sought shelter from the raging storm since they couldn't go any further and they found a place on the eastern side of the canyon with a flat area large enough to accommodate the entire party and shield them from the storm. They needed a huge fire to warm the large party and dry their soaked clothes so they utilized a multi-layered fire platform like the one shown here. Meanwhile, as someone used, used a sole hatchet that they had to chop wood, the metal axe of the head flew off into the deep snow and was lost. The log platform slowly sank deeper and deeper into the snow, creating an eight foot deep hole. One of the members clumsily upset the delicate fire and it was extinguished. Everything was soaked, the wood, the clothes, the blankets. They were becoming desperate. This is where William Eddy, which, who's now becoming the new leader of the group, takes over. He says, I've learned this technique. If we all get into a ring around each other and put our blankets out, you can create almost like a human teepee. Such the snow will come in, but then it insulates it. I, I kind of learned this the first night we camped out in my tent. It was covered in snow. If you saw the snowstorm in the video there, it's much better to leave the snow on your tent. It's a lot warmer than if you shake it off. <laughs> But they get into here and they do that and it probably saved them. They're in a wind, snow, and even rainstorm of, you know, epic proportion. And they're probably right a little bit above 5,000 feet. In the Sierra, probably snow above that, maybe rain. You really don't know in that, depending on the coldness of the storms, what they're dealing with. And a couple of people are starting to fall apart. Antonio dies morning of Christmas Eve. So you can imagine how... Uh, disappointing this is, being out in the middle of nowhere, lost, starving, frozen, and it's Christmas Eve and now people are starting to die. Antonio the first, later on that evening, Christmas Eve, Franklin Graves knows he's going to expire and he calls over his two daughters that are on the group, one about 20, the other 18, and says, I I'm not going to make it, this is it for me, you guys need to do, if you need to use my body for sustenance, that's the deal. The next morning, in the next 24 hours, uh, Patrick Dolan also passed away, as well as the youngster Lemuel Murphy. Interesting tidbit here of the two people that got sent back of the Forlorn Hope 17 started and two, two didn't make the first day. Lemuel's 10-year-old brother, William, went back. He lived to become the district attorney of Yuba County. The other gentleman that went back with him, an older fellow, didn't make it uh, to the end of the year. So they're at the camp, what has become now known as this famous place, the Camp of Death. And we were really interested in finding where is this spot. It's got to be somewhere in that North Fork Canyon. And when they stopped here and those four died, this is the first time in the Donner story where those guys had to resort to cannibalism in order to continue on. So the location has uh, been thought to be lost to history along with the Forlorn Hope Trail itself. But using all the historical resources available, combined with extensive field research and technology and forensics, we believe we may have identified the camp of death. The next short video shows the remote area of our discovery in the canyons of the North Fork. It also captures one of the two canine forensic searches that works, which is a high indication of human remains. You'll also see the vast desolation of this area which made the discovery for us literally finding a needle in the forest.
Did you hear your name? <laughs> Where's Karen? Really believe? Oh. So there's lots of alerts going on out here today. I call her my Geiger counter because that tail goes a mile a minute when she's in scent. What? You got something? Show me. Come in here. Where is it? Well, Camp of, Camp of Death is a place of great reverence, of course, and historical significance. Unfortunately, there would be little forensic evidence left behind, except possibly human teeth, which would have long since washed away down the stream after the snow melt. There also may have been some small metallic pieces off clothing, a button, a pin, a belt buckle, etc. But the only significant artifact would have been that lost axe head, which would be the Holy Grail of Donner finds. In June this year, we discovered what you see here at the site we believe to be the camp of death. We've engaged a PhD in anthropology and will commence a research cooperation with the landowners and the governmental agencies to remove this artifact and determine if the axe indeed matches the year characteristics of a personal axe from the mid-1800s forged back east. Early indications from our anthropologists are looking very promising. Additionally, we hope to engage in a broader search for other possible artifacts in the area. So this part of the journey is to be continued, but now back to our story. <laughs> There's only a few places that we could almost certainly say we are in the same spot that the Forlorn Hope has traveled, and this is one of them. This is called better, we just call it The View. After they left the camp of death, they spent four days there. At the end, you know, obviously they, they, they ended up taking care of the, the four dead people, butchering them up and taking some of that with them, but even they had a little bit more sustenance now and could continue on. And they got up into this place called Sawtooth Ridge. This is both where um, George Stewart and a couple other researchers thought they might have gone. But we're looking for this spot where they, in the journals it says they finally got to the point where they could see where they needed to get to. Sacramento Valley. Nowhere had they along this trip really been able to say that's where we're going. But there's this one spot here where Jaelka up on the tree, uh, this is it. We came around this spot at Sawtooth Ridge and we saw the view. And it's 60 miles in the distance, but you go right down the throat of the North Fork of the American through Giant Gap and you can see the fertile grounds of the valley. And this is where they finally realized, oh, now we can see where we're going and the energy picked up for them, but they're still several miles even from the North Fork of the American River and they're not even halfway to Johnson's Ranch yet. We've always felt a presence with us during the expedition, and several times we had things happen to us that were inexplicable. Now, Tim and I have spent hundreds and hundreds of hours scouting all over that North Fork of the uh, North Fork Canyons, and never once in, in all those hours have we seen a single animal. It is a desolate place, not fit for man nor beast. But on our third day of the expedition, Laying right in the middle of the trail was a dead deer. Well, not far from this place is where William Eddy actually shot a deer and killed it for sustenance for Forlorn Hope. What was this deer doing there? How did it get there? It seemed absolutely impossible to us, and we all experienced a chill down our spine. The next video shows the canyon climb 
with no trail, where we bushwhacked, the valley view that Tim just showed you, and our dear discovery. Right, back to the forlorn hope the 10 remaining members we've got 10 out of 15 still going on and they get to the crossing of the North Fork of America on New Year's Day they've slidden down the final throws of Sawtooth Ridge on their snowshoes riding them like a sled they probably got back down to dirt near the river but now they have one of the steepest climbs I've ever been on Bob and I've done a little bit of running and you can kind of see here in this picture they now have to climb the south wall of the river and what it's described in the books is they were literally hanging on to bushes and trees and anything they could get their hands on to not only get traction in, at the bottom and, and it's still in their snowshoes and at the top they're right back into the snow. At this point, their feet are probably frostbit pretty bad or getting there. Right? They've spent four days not moving at all in that snowstorm. And Jay Fosdick, which was the husband of Sarah Graves and the son-in-law of Franklin Graves, is really starting to fall apart. He's not keeping up. And so it took them an entire day, one full day, to get to the top of the ridge and be up on what would be the edge, the south ridge of the American River, where they proceeded along the ridge. So this picture shows you a 35% grade on the left, which went on for 2,400 feet of elevation, the equivalent of climbing the Empire State Building one and a half times. Now, we undertook the same climb as endurance athletes with modern equipment, fresh legs, and ample energy. And it astounded us how hard the climb was, even with no snow and cleats on our feet. When we arrived at the top, an hour and a half later, we turned to each other in awe and said, how did they do it? So this is uh, the steep climb out of the, ri out of the river, and then they would have traveled across the, th the top of the ridge there, and along that ridge, they saw that the, the river turned due south. And they realized at that point, they had to go back across the river. They didn't want to go south. They knew they wanted to go pretty much west or if southwest, as you can see on the black line, which is the regular route. And they traversed across that ridge, saw the change, and now they had to start back down into the North Fork, kind of between what we would say the mining town of Iowa Hill, which is right here, and that's across that ridge where Jay Fosdick finally dies. Sarah sits with him all night and he expires. She, she had said, oh, I wish I would have died right along with him because she didn't want to continue. At, at that point, uh, you know, they make it to Iowa Hill and uh, this next video I think shows that little piece of us getting out of the river and then our trip into Iowa Hill. It was 27 miles for us that day and we didn't get in there till pretty much the uh, 7.30 at night. This is also the area where uh, it was suggested by William Foster, we need to kill the Miwoks in order to provide sustenance for the rest of us. William Eddy would have no part of it, and he tipped them off, and they took off in the dark of night to run away.
and we did it in like an hour and 20 minutes. Nuts. The forlorn hope <clears throat> made it over to that edge, and when they woke up on the next day, they found out that Lewis and Salvador were gone. And so now we're down to five, uh, seven. We have the, the, the five women and the two men continuing on, and at this point, they need to cross the river again. So from Iowa Hill, they go down to the river crossing uh, that is just really between Iowa Hill and modern-day Colfax. And uh, there's a very famous mining trail there that was built in the early 1850s called the Stevens Trail. Once they crossed the river, that group started following game trails uh, through Colfax and they came to a creek bed that they found Lewis and Salvador in. They weren't moving. They pretty much laid down to die. Their feet gone, no food, emaciated. And this is where Foster, after even hinting that they wanted to kill the Indians on the other side of the river, is really starting to go cuckoo now and uh, him and Eddie get into a little debate. All the Forlorn Hope members at this point had become delirious and William Foster had become unhinged. Foster drew his pistol and vowed to finish the natives. Eddie engaged in a scuffle to stop Foster but was too weak at this point to hold him back. Foster approached the two men and finished them. The food provided energy to proceed but now their bodies were ravaged. Hunger, exhaustion, bloody blistered feet and emotional trauma. They were all slowly dying. A tedious and painful procession lied ahead. At this point, they're probably somewhere around uh, lower Colfax and kind of headed towards the Bear River, at which point they find a footpath that leads them to a Nissanen village. And that would be a, a small Indian village along the Bear River somewhere, because they, they had Nissanen settlements all the way along the Bear River, all the way into, you know, towards Johnson's Ranch. And they get taken care of by this, this group of Indians feeding them uh, nuts and um, you know, acorn bread and things. And they go for a few days and then the bunch just, they, they just run out. So the, all seven of them literally lay down probably somewhere on the east side of Camp Far West and west of Auburn that said, this is it, we can't go any further. The two Indians are like, well, well now what do we do? And it's William Eddy who finally finds enough energy to keep going and the two Indians literally almost carry him to Johnson Ranch in the Adobe House where they find the people open the door and here's this emaciated man, clothes torn, you know, like a skeleton, feet bleeding, and he just says, bread. And the young lady behind starts to cry when she sees him. So Eddie had broken through and he told them immediately there were six others behind him back on the trail. So they mustered her, uh, an immediate relief and that evening picked up the rest. And they were all brought to Johnson's ran Johnson Ranch and on January 18th, 1847 was the day the world first learned of the horrible fate of the Donner Party from the survivors. Our next video will show you our expedition from Iowa Hill through the foothills and onto Johnson Ranch where the wagon ruts are etched in the earth for eternity. During this stretch, the Forlorn Hope would have still encountered snow and then cold driving rain and then mud. You'll also see the wooden post signifying the location of the Adobe House, a place where we laid all those tribute cards that are shown here of each Forlorn Hope member that we'd carried with us. Each card was laid gently at the base of the post and our emotions became flooding forward. We felt a sense of burden released and a mission accomplished. The Forlorn Hope had been reunited after 174 years.
Just remember, <laughs> never take no cutoffs and hurry along as fast as you can. Virginia Reed. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you no so what impact did the Forlorn Hope have on California and, and things that happened after that? Uh, if you look at the time it took them to get back, you can imagine the anticipation of these folks at the lake looking in the horizon every day hoping somebody's going to come. They leave on December 6th. They don't see anybody for a month. It's not till two months out that the relief party arrived. The first relief that was alerted by the Forlorn Hope, it wasn't until almost two weeks later that the second relief came in. We figured that it saved 25 lives in that window, which is, if you use a little, you know, calculators and, and other things you can get off the web, the impact is that 24,200 people today have the Forlorn Hope to thank for making that trip out. And one of the things Bob and I tried to, and when you look at that expedition, the Donner Party has always been represented as kind of a tragedy. It's just, you know, kind of grim. We kind of embraced the Forlorn Hope as a victory of superstars that really, you know, went to another level to continue their families and others. So our research and activities do continue, and we'd like to announce uh, our next project, the Donner Relief Expedition. On the 14th of February, 2022, we'll set off from Johnson Ranch and follow the path of the first relief party who braved the vicious winter conditions to try and rescue the Donner Party Stilt Relief. We'll have more information posted on our website, which is called forlornhope.org this fall. We hope you've enjoyed the story of the Forlorn Hope, and it's provided you with renewal and uh, respect for the human spirit and the will to survive. Theirs is one of the greatest endurance treks in all of history. We thank you for joining us today. It's been a thrill, a true thrill, for Tim and I to be here, and we're very grateful and very humbled. We look forward to meeting many of you afterwards and later today. Thank you, and God bless. <laughs>